What you will hear in this session is a number of Minskian themes that have to do with regulation, um, supervision, re-regulation, inadequacy of the Dodd-Frank bill, even though this is a gravitational pull. Um, you will also hear about uh, issues of the Federal Reserve and what needs to do for being accountable to the people in some ways. It hasn't been, as you will see. And also, um, at the end, Eric will present some measures of financial fragility. Now, the people that will speak are all known to you, and I won't take very much time to tell you who they are. Um, just to say, Jan Kregel is um, my closest colleague, along with Randy, I have been at the Institute since the beginning. So um, they can take a lot of the credit. I'll take all the blame. Um, and Eric is a recent sort of uh, associate to the Institute, although he's getting older. So anyway, um, I think that um, you'll find some interesting things that will remind us of Minsky and um, the importance of his contribution to financial structure and um, uh, the issues that he raised about financial fragility. Jan? We've got this. Okay. Basically, what I'm going to do is to start out with some general observations on what we mean by financial regulation, why we have financial regulation. Uh, then to go on and look very briefly at Dodd-Frank, and finally to end up with a number of alternative proposals that are currently uh, being discussed in Congress, basically because nobody actually believes that Dodd-Frank will ever be finished as formal regulation, and increasingly people are under a, uh, I think, very sensible belief that Dodd-Frank really does not address the difficulties that are being faced by the, uh, by the financial system. And then finally at the end, hopefully if we have time, we'll look at a proposal that uh, Hyminski put forward in, uh, I think it was a year before he died dealing with the way that he thought we might deal with the difficulties of banks that are too big to fail and banks that are subject to the kind of moral hazard threats that come from uh, deposit insurance. So if we look at the idea, what is prudential regulation for? Okay, everybody talks about prudential regulation. Well, just exactly what is it? Well. We know what being prudent is. Prudent is not taking a whole bunch of risks. But beyond that, if you look for formal definitions of prudential regulation, they are extremely difficult to find. So if you look at the uh, UK regulatory authority, they say to ensure safety and soundness. Well, what does it mean to ensure safety and soundness? Well, basically it means that you don't want the banks to go bankrupt. Okay, so prudential regulation is in the, in the essence preventing bankruptcy. If we look at Minsky's definition, Minsky's definition is much more operational. Minsky's definition is what? Well, financial stability requires a guarantee that cash commitments can always be met, okay? That's how you prevent insolvency. You make sure that cash inflows are sufficient to meet cash outflows. How do you do that? Well, there are a number of ways in which you do that, and when we get to the end of the uh, presentation, we'll look at the kinds of proposals that I now, if we look at prudential regulation and supervision, normally it tends historically to be conditioned by what banks in fact do. And I'm not going to go through all of these regulations, but if we look at the 1800s in the U.S., we had a thing that was called wildcat banking. Wildcat <laughs> banking basically said that banks could issue banknotes, and as Paul McCulley pointed out, banks generally, and Minsky always supported this, banks are basically speculative. That is, they issue commitments that they cannot honor. And what did we do? Well, we regulated the banks by saying banks have got to hold reserves. Okay, they had to hold gold reserves. So what would banks do? The supervisor would come into the Wildcat Bank, they'd pull out a big box full of gold, supervisor would say, okay, good, this is a safe and sound bank. He would then get on his horse, go to the next bank, and the banker would then take the box and run as fast as he could to the next bank, and the supervisor would then see exactly the same box full of gold. Okay, that was prudential 
regulation and supervision for wildcat banks, all right? And basically, this is the way the, sy way the system runs, okay? You look at what the banks do, you set up some sort of regulation to make sure that they can meet these commitments that they cannot meet, and you set up the regulation that way. Now, basically what happened in the U.S. is that we went through a series of these sets of regulations until we hit the 1999 Act and Dodd-Frank, okay? These things basically didn't provide regulations that were supposed to make the banks safe and sound. What they did was to say, let's let the banks do virtually anything they want to do, we'll put some band-aids on their activities, but make sure now that they have a sufficient amount of capital to avoid bankruptcy, to avoid insolvency. So it's a basic change in the way you look at the kind of uh, prudential regulation. Now, what I would argue is that there's a better way to look at the way uh, prudential regulation is operated, and that's to look at how banks make their money, okay? It's not what they do, it's how do they generate their income. So if we look at the range of activities, you find that what regulation has tended to do is attempted to change the way the banks make money. Okay? In particular, Glass-Steagall did what? Glass-Steagall said, we don't want banks to make money by speculating in securities, so we're going to turn them into a different kind of money-making machine. And that money-making machine was, in terms of providing what we call the monopoly on the payment system, regulation Q, zero deposit rates, so basically you're giving the banks free money, they don't have to pay for it, and there are no capital requirements, as uh, Jose noted this morning, uh, basically, the U.S. system functioned without any sorts of capital requirements until Paul Volcker uh, got into the, uh, into the problem of trying to kill inflation in the 1980s. Capital requirements were totally unnecessary in terms of the safety and soundness of banking. What was required was generating a sufficient amount of income for the banks to be able to meet losses and to meet basic, uh, basic bad loans. Graham Leach Bliley, again, make money any way you can. And basically making money any way you can meant, number one, speculating, and number two, because the return on assets tends to be relatively low in the kind of competitive banking system, remember the monopoly was now eliminated for the banks, so competition reduced returns on assets. How do you get the return on equity up? Leverage. Okay, so that by definition, these kinds of regulations said to the banks, okay, you go out and make as much money as you can. If you need to lever to do it, you do it. My favorite example of this is that Bankers Trust, which was one of the first banks that operated this, uh, Charlie Sanders said, I'm gonna take Bankers Trust and I'm gonna produce a bank that gives you 20% return on equity, okay? Now, if you ever see a banker telling you that he's gonna produce 20% return on equity when his return on assets is usually not higher than one or two or three percent, then you know there's a problem and you know that he's got a whole lot of leverage, okay? The point was that Graham Leach blindly said, okay, that's fine. We really don't care how that works, okay? Now, so if we look at Dodd-Frank, we said basically Dodd-Frank provided a system that was supposed to give you regulations, uh, what did it do? It said that, okay, we're going to have your derivatives trades, your derivatives trades are gonna go on exchanges. Okay, as Jose, sa Jose said this morning, Secretary of the Treasury, what did he do? He didn't deregulate trading in Forex, he simply said Forex trades don't have to go onto a regulated exchange. But this didn't change, basically change the way the banks made their money. The only provision of Dodd-Frank is the provision that still is not implemented, and that's the Volcker Rule, which tries to cut back on the ability of banks to speculate on, uh, speculate on assets. So if we look at state of implementation of Dodd-Frank, again, I won't go through all of these, but basically, when Dodd-Frank was written, it was written as what we call a shell and the shell had to be filled out. It is still not filled out. 40% of the 400 required rules have yet to be finalized. 60% of the deadlines have been missed. And if you read the financial press, every day you notice that one of the regulatory agencies that is responsible for implementing or writing this legislation announces that it's going to postpone implementation. Now, what this has done 
is to create, if you look down at the bottom, a certain amount of continued congressional dissatisfaction. So as I mentioned, we have a lot of proposals that effectively displace Dodd-Frank and attempt more or less to go back to something that looks very much like the approach that we had under Glass-Steagall. That is to limit the way the banks make money and to limit the way the banks tend to operate. Now, there are a number of these proposals. Uh, Richard Fisher from the Dallas Fed is proposing a simple breakup of the uh, large, too big to fail banks. Tom Honig, who was the president of the Kansas City Fed and who has made a proposal similar to Fisher's, has come in with a another proposal now that he is vice chairman of the insurance uh, entity, the FDIC, to restrict the federal safety net to banks undertaking core banking activities. Okay? So again, we're back to this idea that the regulation is supposed to be related somehow or other to what the banks do and we're going to tell the banks what they, what they can do in a very similar way to Glass-Steagall. Uh, the Brown-Vitter Act, Brown-Vitter Act basically says the biggest problem we have is the Basel Committee. Let's get rid of the Basel Committee. In fact, it says we cannot have risk-weighted capital adequacy ratios, what we do is we're going to set gross leverage ratios and that's going to be it. That's going to be the way we regulate. Finally, and not surprisingly, as I said, what is happening is the same thing that happened in U.S. history. That is, we started out with the crisis. We had Glass-Steagall. Now we have the uh, gram leach Bliley, which repealed Glass-Steagall. Lo and behold, the most recent proposal is Glass-Steagall all over again, okay? So the 21st Century Glass-Steagall Act of 2000, uh, 2013. Now, I won't go, very, uh, go through all of these particular uh, proposals because in general, as we've said, the basic ideas is that you're attempting to return banks to some sort of similar position uh, to the one we had under Glass-Steagall. So if we just look at the Glass-Steagall Act, the return to Glass-Steagall, to reduce risks to the financial system by limiting banks' ability to engage in certain risky <coughs> activities and limiting conflicts of interest to reinstate certain Glass-Steagall protections that were repealed by the graham leach bliley Act. This act may be cited as the 21st Century Glass-Steagall Act of, of 2013. Now, basically, what does it do? It does exactly the same thing that Glass-Steagall did. Now, one of the interesting points is that two, three, I don't know, Dimitri, was it three years ago, I produced a piece which I said that it's impossible to go back to Glass-Steagall. And the paper goes through a series of reasons why it's impossible to do that. A number of them have to do with the way the courts treat legislation. A number of them have to do with the way regulatory agencies treat financial regulation. Uh, and a number of them deal with basically the definition of what is a bank. Okay, if you want, Glass-Steagall had one very clear hold in it, and it said that banks can do anything that is considered to be the business of banking. And when this part of the legislation went to the courts, it was very easy for banks to extend or to get rid of the separation that Glass-Steagall had produced. So all you had to do was to go to the court and you tell to the court, look, I am a banker. My clients want derivatives. Glass-Steagall says that I can't trade derivatives. Rule. And the court would look and the court would get representations from the financial industry which would say, yes, the business of banking means providing the ability of your clients to hedge exposures so that you can do derivatives trading, or you can do securities trading, okay? So basically, what this particular law does is to say, we will define the business of banking. We're going to write it into the law. So if you look at the law, it goes through step by step. Each one of those factors that allowed for the repeal of Glass-Steagall is now written into this law. So that the idea is that if it ever goes to court, if the thing passes and it ever goes to court, we can say no. It says here that you cannot 
trade derivatives. It says here that the business of banking is only taking deposits and lending short-term money. Okay? So the problem with this is how will banks make money under the new Glass-Steagall Act? Because under the old act, what did banks do? Well, we said that they borrowed money at zero interest and they lent short-term basically to businesses. The problem is banks don't do that anymore. And in particular, Minsky noted in, uh, in reviewing Glass that Glass-Steagall, when it was introduced, had this problem. That is, it presumed that banking business was different from what banks, in fact, did. So that at that stage, it was outmoded. So basically, if you look at the difficulty with all these types of regulations, is that <coughs> it's based on a misunderstanding, what I would call a misunderstanding, of how the banking system works and how banks, in fact, make their money. So if we go back, once upon a time, Bankers insisted that they simply accepted and kept the deposits of households. There was a story they used to have if you were a little kid, you had a quarter, a 25 cent piece, you'd take it to the bank, you'd deposit it in your account, you'd go back two weeks later and you'd ask the bank for your quarter back. And when the banker would give you a different quarter, you would say, well, this is not, not my money. This is not what I gave you. And obviously, because this is not what banks do. The problem was that when academics challenged this idea that banks don't create money, that is, that they don't simply keep deposits, okay, we came up this with this idea that monetary creation came from the credit multiplier. That is, it came from the kinds of reserves that the banks kept. Remember our story about the wildcat banks keeping the box of gold, okay? So the presumption was that anything in the monetary system could be controlled by means of controlling bank reserves or by controlling high-powered money. And you have the entire monetarist tradition which is based on this level. Now, for Minsky, what do banks do? Well, banks don't find reserves and then lend those reserves, what banks do is they go out and lend and then they find the reserves. They find the reserves how? They find the reserves as Jose said, you go on the liability side of the balance sheet, you get the assets and then you fund those assets. Now, what does this mean? In particular, it means that number one, banks always have what I call the speculative financing profile or Back to what Paul McCulley said yesterday, banks make commitments they can't keep. Or I would say banks are always short cash. Okay? They claim to provide you with your quarter, but they really don't have it. Okay? So this means that if a bank can't meet its reserve requirement, which is supposed to be the prudential part of the operation, what happens? Well, central bank is faced with two possibilities. Either it allows the bank to fail, which it doesn't want to do, or it creates the reserves that the banks need. So implicitly, the reserves at this point become endogenous, okay? So that if we look at the stability under Minsky's definition, stability requires that the cash that you require to meet your commitments is always available, okay? Now, if it's always available, how do we do this? Well, we can go back to reserves, okay? In the beginning, we used to have reserves that we said were backed by physical things by gold. When we created the Federal Reserve System, the idea was what? The idea was that you were going to pool bank reserves, you would have a deposit in the Fed, so what you needed in order to meet that liquidity, to meet that short cash position, you simply went to the Fed and you took your reserves out of the Fed and you use them to pay off your short cash position. Okay? This was fine until, and I said until, we came up with this idea that somehow or other reserves are controlling the money supply. And at that point, what happened? Well, you never were able to use reserves in order to meet your outstanding commitments. Why? Because reserves were supposed to control the money supply. 
reserves were a money supply control mechanism, they were no longer a prudential regulatory item. Okay? Now, this morning, Jose talked about a whole series of measures to ensure liquidity. And I'm looking at all of these measures and I'm saying, well, really the only liquidity that we have in the system to meet your short cash position is to go to the central bank, is to go to the Federal Reserve. How did we used to do this? We kept a reserve deposit. What is a reserve deposit with the central bank? It's direct access, okay, to central bank cash. Now, if my reserve position is not large enough, the bank, the central bank, acts as lender of last resort. And it says, okay, if your reserve position, your presental reserve is not large enough, I'm going effectively to buy up some of your assets in exchange for cash, okay? This is where the liquidity in the market is. No matter what kind of definitions you give of the kinds of assets that you think are liquid, they are only liquid if you can take them to the central bank and get the central bank to lend to you against them. So this business of Basel III of trying to calculate these liquidity conditions and to claim that this somehow or other makes the bank safer or sounder is totally irrelevant. If there is no market to sell the assets. The only market that exists is the central bank. Now, somebody mentioned that this is some new invention, that the central bank is a market maker. That's nonsense. The central bank has always done this since the creation of the Federal Reserve. That's what the Federal Reserve was there for, to pool those, uh, to pool those reserves. How much time have we got? Five. Hmm? Five? Okay. So this is the idea, is that if you're looking at the stability Stability comes from getting that cash. Now, the interesting thing is that Hai talked about a number of other conditions in addition to having reserves and having access to the discount window in order to be able to meet your commitments. The macro condition, government deficits. Government deficits do what? They support incomes. Supporting incomes supports cash inflow. So if stability is cash inflows meeting cash outflows, you want to act on the ability of borrowers to be able to meet those commitments. How do you do it? Well, big government, I called it. If the government is running a policy which keeps the economy running at some place near, uh, near capacity, then you're going to be generating incomes that allow the households to be able to meet those cash commitments, okay? This is not a question of prudential regulation in the banking system. It's a question of prudential regulation for the entire system. So now we have this idea that prudential regulation extends, we call it macro prudential regulation. Big government is macro prudential regulation, and that big government means that uh, the government is going to be running a, uh, running a deficit. Micro condition. Well, in the micro condition, I said that we want the discount window open to all financial institutions that are short cash. This is the big bank. And this is the point I mentioned before. People say, well, you know, now the, the uh, bank is a market maker. Hai has always said that the only way that you can guarantee that you're going to have financial stability is if the central bank is willing to lend to A, all institutions that have balance sheets, you notice I didn't say financial institutions, all institutions, financial or non-financial, and against all assets of the system, okay? So market maker or not, I mean market maker is really nonsense. Market makers do what? Market makers are dealers. Market makers hold inventories of things. Central banks don't hold inventory, well now they do hold inventories of these assets because they had to buy a lot, but generally, Central banks don't hold inventories of printing presses, for example, but they are willing and should be willing to lend against a printing press. So this idea of market makers is really a, a misinformation of the way banks work. Okay, then finally, at the end, I have what I call Minsky's secret weapon. Okay, Minsky's secret weapon is not really secret, but it's something that more or less everybody forgets, and that is Secret weapon, number one, the basic idea, and this is something which came up 
came up already this morning when Jose was talking basically about the fact uh, that I put emphasis on the idea that every position in an asset generates a liability. Okay? Now, if this is the case, and if you drive the system in terms of investment, investments require, investments are assets that require liabilities. So that if you drive the system, you drive the growth of the system by supporting investment, it means that you're going to be generating more financial liabilities and you're going to be creating more what I call financial layering, which is implicitly going to create risk. Is there an easier way to do that? And I says yes. If we substitute employment as the target rather than investment for economic policy, this is a precondition for financial reforms aimed at decreasing instability. The emphasis on investment in economic growth rather than on employment policy is a mistake. A full employment economy is bound to expand. Okay, think of that for a minute. Okay, we always worry about ramping up investment in order to get growth to expand. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, for the moment in Brazil it's not working too great. On the other hand, if our objective is full employment, then by definition the system is going to be growing because the Brazilian population is still growing. Okay? So this simply solves that problem. A full employment economy is bound to expand, whereas an economy that aims at accelerating growth through devices to induce capital intensive private investment not only may not grow, but may be increasingly inequitable in its income distribution inefficient in its choice of techniques, and unstable in its overall importance. So what do you do? Financial stability requires to s the stabilization of the income of the household sector. And I proposed what we call a government employment guarantee program that would ensure that households always had the income to be able to meet their financial commitments, that the financial stability of the system would be met. Remember we said highest definition of financial stability is being able and a guarantee that you will be able to meet those commitments. Well, this is another kind of what we would call macro prudential, macro prudential regulation. And then finally the idea of functional finance, that is that you use the government deficit to make sure that the system runs at full employment. Okay? You decide your budget position on whether or not you are or not at the level of full employment, <coughs> rather than doing what? Running your f budget balance in order to balance the budget. <coughs> because as Paul McCauley told us yesterday, this is probably not a good principle and certainly not very good practice. <laughs>